Hi, and welcome for this week's episode of Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle. And today we have with us Gary Orr, who's a retired consultant, psychiatrist and entrepreneur. And he's here today to talk to us about the gift of burnout. So over to you, Gary, why is burnout important? Hi, Linda, it's great to be here and much appreciated for having me on the show. We're talking about burnout and the reason why burnout is important is because burnout has economic consequences and personal consequences. And as a phenomenon in the workplace, it's become increasingly recognized as a mental health problem that actually impacts on the economic effectiveness of society. So burnout first entered the definition of working place stresses a long time ago, but increasingly it's become recognized as a phenomenon that is really important. And in the current classification of international disease, um, which is set up by the World Health Organization, burnout is actually a recognized category of mental health disturbance. And the definition in ICD-11 of burnout is characterized by really three core tenets. Um, a sense of emotional and mental health exhaustion related to workplace stress. And then along with that, an increasing sense of alienation from the workplace with an increasing sense of cynicism towards the workplace and towards one's chosen role. And then along with that, a loss of individual effectiveness in the workplace. And that is why burnout is incredibly important because what we're actually seeing today is increasing numbers of people experiencing this phenomenon. Now, depending on what you read and the information source that we refer to, the prevalence of burnout, so by that, what I mean is the number of people as a percentage of the population experiencing burnout can range anywhere between 10% of the overall workforce up to as high as 80% in the individual workforce. So different professions are at different risks of burnout and professions that are at greatest risk of burnout are professions that I think a lot of people out there would not necessarily recognize as being at risk of burnout. So classic burnout professions are the medical profession, allied health professions such as nurses, social workers, ambulance workers, police, teachers, lawyers. Now, all of these professions encompass a number of characteristics. Um, some of which will contribute to burnout and some of which might be protective of burnout. And I like to think about burnout within a framework. And the framework I use in thinking about burnout are the factors that will contribute towards burnout um, and then the factors that we can look at in terms of understanding how to avoid burnout and how to manage burnout if and when it does occur. There's also another interesting phenomenon, and that is whether or not, given the prevalence of burnout in the workforce, whether today we should be beginning to think about burnout as part of the passage of an individual work. And this is quite a controversial view, but actually, instead of seeing burnout as a negative phenomenon, seeing burnout as a positive phenomenon in order to rejuvenate one, one's own individual career, but also at an organizational level, as a wake-up call to an organization, that it needs to focus on the health and well-being of its workforce. You might ask why I come to be here to talk to you about burnout. Well, I actually experienced my own personal burnout journey and it might be quite useful to talk about some of my own experiences and then use those as examples of how we can actually manage the process of burnout. 
you introduced me as a retired consultant psychiatrist. And as a psychiatrist, I worked in the UK and New Zealand. And I've experienced different types of service within both those countries. But my own personal journey towards burnout actually began when I was working in a very busy environment. I had a very high caseload. The environment had a number of resource limitations. And as a consequence, workplace stressors were, were very high. And that particular service, uh, not dissimilar to many services in the public sector, had a high degree of staff turnover, a high degree of violence and aggression on within the workplace. And th these factors actually contribute to burnout. So what I'm saying is that there are organizational factors that contribute towards burnout, and there are personal factors that can contribute towards burnout. So let's look at organizational factors, because I think if we're going to look at how we can prevent burnout, we then need to look at the factors that contribute towards burnout. So factors that contribute towards burnout can be where an individual worker finds themselves in an environment where there might be resource limitations. And here I'm particularly thinking of individuals that will be working in public sector environments. So doctors, nurses, ambulance workers, teachers, it's fairly well recognized that the teaching profession carries with it a high risk of burnout. We'll go to break now. And after the break, we'll be back with Gary with more about burnout and the symptoms of burnout. Welcome back, and we have Gary Orr with us with more about burnout. So, Gary, what would be the symptoms of burnout? Really good question. And coming back to that framework that I was talking about in terms of organizational factors and individual factors, in this instance, let's talk about the individual symptoms of burnout. So, coming back to the definition of burnout, it's a sense of emotional exhaustion. So what an individual can begin to feel on their burnout journey is increasing tiredness, exhaustion, symptoms of feeling depressed, demotivated, not wanting to get up in the morning, not wanting to go to work, and then along with that, symptoms of anxiety. And what then can actually happen is that that set of symptoms then can then begin to expand where an individual will tend to avoid going to work. So what we then see is increasing absenteeism from the workplace. And then as a consequence of that, an individual's workplace performance and effectiveness will deteriorate. In terms of my own personal experience, I did experience some of those symptoms as well. And if we just drill it down into symptoms experienced by the medical profession, because there's been a lot of academic research in the literature around the consequences of burnout for medical professionals. Um, and the incidence and prevalence of burnout in medical professionals, depending on which papers you're looking at, can be as high as 80%. And what we do know from the literature is that those doctors will then begin to experience frank mental health symptoms, as I've talked about. And then along with that, there will be consequences, not only absenteeism, but also shifts in the way an individual practitioner might practice in terms of increasing prevalence of what we call defensive practice, increasing seeking of second opinions, and other factors that then will decrease the effectiveness of that individual practitioner. So once those symptoms have been identified, then it becomes about how we can actually then proceed to shift the experience for the individual worker. 
And the responsibility of that shift, in my view, should be both organizational and individual. And an effective organization will actually promote a healthy workforce. Now, what you will see is a lot of organizations will actually talk about promoting a healthy workforce. It's one thing talking about it, but it's another thing actually walking the talk. And this is what I'm here to talk about today, because for a workforce to have access to psychological counseling services for its employees, that's great. But actually, to really effectively manage burnout in an organization, it's inherent on the leadership of that organization to begin to lead teams so that they actually are able to work at their best. So then how do we actually promote effective leadership of organizations so that actually those organizations manage themselves effectively and work effectively and have a healthy workforce? So what we're talking about is effective organizational responses to burnout and how an organization can begin to shift. So protective factors about burnout. Um, supportive team leadership, supportive teams, a sense of belonging to an organization, a sense of identifying with the organization's core message, with the organization's core responses. When a team identifies with that and when a team begins to feel part of that organization and when an individual begins to feel part of a team, those are effective factors at managing burnout. Other quite important factors are individuals being able to have a sense of control and autonomy over the way they work, how their work is assessed, how their career progression prospects are actually managed in the organization. And what we, what we see today is organizations that actually have very good responses to promoting career progression, to instilling a sense of belonging to a team. And they can be as simple as team leaders genuinely and sincerely checking up on how the team is going, through to the classic example is a Friday afternoon get together where the entire team comes together, reviews the progress of the week and what people have done well, what people have done less well, and a nice end to what might have been a busy week. So those are organizational factors that an organization can bring in. Moving on to individual factors, and this is where I think a lot of people in particularly high profile, high stress professions actually tend to miss out on. Because what we're seeing today is really high stress professions with the advent of technology where literally you take your work home. So the expectation that an individual is responding to emails at 10, 11 o'clock tonight, we live in a globalized environment. So in Australia, you might have, be, have a branch office that is on the other side of the Pacific in the US or in Europe. So emails and information will be coming at that worker 24 hours a day. How do we then begin to manage that? And it's about an individual being able to effectively go, actually, I'm not taking my emails home. I'm not going to respond to that because I work during a working day. The moment you step beyond that, then what actually happens is your work stresses go up and your risk of burnout goes up. Well, thanks, Gary. We'll go to break now. And then after the break, we'll be back with more about burnout and managing burnout. Welcome back. And we have Gary Orr with us talking about managing burnout this time. 
So Gary, can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences in managing burnout? One of the things that we've been talking about at burnout is that burnout is a series of symptoms. So it's symptoms of a mental health problem in terms of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and then along with that, a sense of exhaustion, fatigue, and sleep disturbance, and a sense of social alienation, isolation, and decreasing workplace effectiveness. So depending on the severity of the individual experience of burnout, then it can be focusing on each of those sets of symptoms. So depending on the severity of the mental health symptoms, then it's about actually looking at how the individual can best manage those. But it's not only about how the individual can manage those, it's also about how the organization can assist the individual in managing those symptoms. Um, and that can be very simple things from taking time out, realigning workplace hours, support within the workplace, support outside of the workplace. So family, friends, a partner to talk to, and if the symptoms are significant, well then obviously it's about being able to seek appropriate support for that from a recognized professional or counselor. Then some people will experience burnout to such a significant degree that they might opt to take a career break, or in extreme cases, some people might actually opt to not only take a career break, but also to then begin to shift and change careers. Because one of the consequences of burnout can be this loss of alienation, the sense of alienation, loss of identity within that chosen profession. And sadly, these symptoms can be quite commonplace in medical professionals. And some doctors who experience burnout will actually then go on to retrain in a different profession or remove themselves from clinical practice and work in healthcare consulting roles or actually do something else. In terms of my own personal experience, I opted to leave clinical practice and I went back to design school and studied interior and commercial design and set myself up as an, an interior designer and allowed my creative entrepreneurial side to actually flourish and come forward. And I used that process as a time of recuperation, a time of rejuvenation, and a time of actually looking for new challenges and re-establishing my professional identity. Now, all of that is really important because as individuals, we all have core components of how we identify ourselves. And a professional identity is part of who we are. You know, yes, I am Gary, I am a consultant psychiatrist, I'm an interior designer, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm also a partner, friend. It's all of those things that come together to define who we are as individuals. And it's important to actually nurture each one of those components of ourselves. So then how do we actually nurture those? Who do we actually go and speak? speak to and who do we actually seek assistance from. Some people will argue that the mental health symptoms need to be treated within the context of a biomedical format. I would argue that actually the process of recovery from burnout should be a process of taking time out, realigning oneself, and that process really comes about in terms of looking after one's own health and well-being. So there are very basic things that we can do in terms of taking time out. That's having a hobby, exercise programs, diet, yoga, meditation. And on a personal level, the most effective things that I did was engage a personal trainer on a fairly rigid personal training regime. He was fantastic. I changed my diet and I became very aware of what I was eating. And in actual fact, I engaged on a whole process of professional 
nutritional training. So during my burnout journey, actually added a whole series of knowledge through my nutritional training in terms of actually what worked in terms of diet, fitness, and exercise. The other phenomenon that happens when people are burnt out is that people may well resort to using harmful substances. So, you know, alcohol and illicit substances. Now, I was quite lucky because I didn't go down that pathway. But obviously, for individuals who do find themselves going down that pathway, then it's about seeking appropriate assistance in order to cut down and reduce the harm effects of using illicit substances. Because that will all have an impact on how we function. So in summary, what we've been talking about is burnout is an organizational phenomenon. It's an individual phenomenon. It has massive economic consequences for society. It has really significant personal consequences. And what we should be looking at is how societal responses to burnout can be effectively managed, organizational responses can be effectively managed, and how we as individuals also have a responsibility to manage our own health and well-being in the workforce. And on a parting note, burnout very often is seen at an organizational perspective as an individual phenomenon. What we do know from the literature is that organizations have a very significant role to play in managing burnout in the workforce. So I would argue that burnout today requires a societal response rather than just an individual response. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Wow, all about burnout. And for more information on Gary Orr and managing burnout, then please go to our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And we'll say bye-bye for now from all of us here at Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle. And we'll see you next week with other important topics and guests.